Talked about, uh, you've talked about wanting to make a Western, but it is uh, impossible to watch this movie without thinking about the fact that slavery as a subject has been largely absent from Hollywood cinema in the hundred years, roughly, since uh, Birth of a Nation. Um, what, uh, what sense of responsibility did you have in terms of making a movie that brings uh, slavery out front and center like this? Well, I've always wanted to uh, do a movie that deals with America's horrific past with slavery. But the way I wanted to deal with it is, as opposed to doing a straight historical movie with a capital H, I actually thought it could be better if it was wrapped up in genre. I mean, the thing is, it seems to me that uh, so many Westerns that actually take place during slavery times have just bent over backwards to avoid it, as, as is America's way. <laughs> which is actually kind of interesting because most other countries have actually been forced to deal with the atrocities that they've uh, committed and actually the world has made them deal with the atrocities that they've committed. But, uh, but it's kind of everybody's fault here in America. White, black, nobody wants to really deal with it. Nobody wants to stare at it. And I think it's like in the story of, of all the different types of slave narratives that could have existed in the 245 years when slavery, during this time of slavery under America, uh, there's a zillion stories, a zillion dramatic, exciting, adventurous, heartbreaking, triumphant stories that could be told. And living in a world now where everyone says there are no new stories, there's a whole bunch of them, and they're all American stories that could be told. And so I wanted to be one of the first ones out the gate with it. And uh, for Jamie, although uh, Carrie and Sam, if you want to uh, jump in on this too, when you <laughs> read the script, what was your what were your first impressions about being asked to play slaves in this movie? Well, I wasn't uh, uh, asked to play. Um, I actually saw that the movie was already going, and someone else was supposed to play it. Uh, and I thought, wow, here's another project that I haven't heard about. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, actually, I had a management change. <laughs> Uh, and it just to to tell you my act, my my acting hustle was like, uh, first of all, I don't care what it is, it's Quentin Tarantino and all these people on this stage, and I feel that the people here on this stage can tackle uh, absolutely any subject matter, just as far as artistic ability. That's the first thing. Reading the script, uh, I'm from Texas, so being in the South, there's a racial component. Uh, and I love the South. I mean, no I, no other place I'd rather uh, be from. But there are racial components in the South, me being called nigger, growing up as a kid. So when I read the script, <coughs> I didn't knee-jerk to the word nigger like someone from maybe New York or L.A. would, would knee-jerk because that was something I ex experienced. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, but you know what I mean? So it's like, it's, it's like, and I, and, but what I did gravitate to was, the love story of, of Django and Broomhilda, and the first of everything in, the, in this film. When you see movies about slavery, and, and, uh, and, and Quentin is, is, has made mention to this, and like everybody knows, we never get a chance to see the slave actually, you know, fight back, actually, uh, you know, do, do for himself. And in this movie, there's a lot of firsts. And as we actually went on to shoot the movie, we, we started to comment on these are some of the things that you, that you, you, you know, you'll see for the first time. So for me, it was just, uh, it, it was about the work. And we knew that uh, coming into it, there's going to be all of the other things said and everything about it. But um, it's, it's been a fantastic ride thus. Um, I think a lot of times people in the past may have felt nervous about playing a slave because so many of the narratives that we've told in film and television about slavery are about powerlessness. And this is not a film about that. This is a film about a black man who finds his freedom and rescues his wife. He is an agent of his own power. He is a liberator. He's a hero. And so there's nothing shameful about that. It's really exciting and hopeful and inspiring. There were two things. I mean, I was 
very moved by the love story, particularly in a time in our American history when black people were not allowed to fall in love and get married because marriage, that kind of connection got in the way of the selling of human beings. So to have a story between a husband and a wife at a time when black people weren't allowed to be husband and wife was not only educational but again hopeful and um, it's, it, we've seen this love story a million times about star-crossed lovers. It's just that they don't come from two different Italian families like Romeo and Juliet. The thing that stands in the way of them being with each other is the institution of slavery. So Jane goes out to get his woman, and he's got to take down slavery to get her, take down <coughs> Calvin Candy. And the other thing was in terms of first, I really, I mean, I said to Quentin in our first meeting, I feel like I want to do this movie for my father because my father grew up in a world where there were no black superheroes. And that's what this movie is. Sam, the character of Steven, I think, is. You asked one question. Oh, 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 now you're changing the question. No, I'm. I'm <laughs> you've worked with. You don't want to know how I felt about all this. Well, you can, you can, you can, you can mention that, but you've worked with Quentin so many times, I feel like. The more interesting thing to ask is... I have intelligent things to say about this yet. <laughs> I, I, wa I want you to talk about this, the psychology of this character. It, to me, is maybe the most interesting character in the film and the, the sort of the relationship that he has both to Calvin Candy but also to the other slaves and the sense of... Relationship. The small power that he's, that he's holding on to. Small power? I'm the power behind the throne. What are you talking about? I'm like the Spook Cheney of, of Candyland. <laughs> yeah, I'm all up in that. But um, <clears throat> you see, when I got it, <laughs> what? <laughs> you knew that. You knew that. Same thing we said at the rehearsal table all day. Exactly. It's like, it's what it is. Um, you know. <laughs> To tell this story, you have to have you know that particular character, especially if it's in this setting. So when I got the script from uh, Quentin, he just called me, told me he wrote a western, he wanted me to read Stephen. I complained about being 15 years too old to be Django, uh, and and I was done with that. And then when I read the script, I called him back and said, "So you want me to be the most despicable Negro in cinematic history?" And we were both kind of like laughed together and said, "Yeah, yeah, <laughs> let's get on that," you know, and and. And not only was that a great artistic opportunity and, and, and to, to create something that was iconic and to take what people know as Uncle Tom and turn it on his head in a powerful way, it also gave me an opportunity to uh, do really nasty shit to the person that got the role that I thought I should have had. <laughs> Payback's a bitch. Yeah, it is. <laughs> you know, and it was written beautifully that way, so I could do that. Uh, but, you know, to tell this story, you have to have that guy. Uh, and I mean, Stephen is the, is the freest slave in the, in, the, in the history of cinema. He has all the powers of the master and literally is the master during the times and most times when Calvin is off Mandingo fighting. He makes the plantation run. Everybody on that plantation knows him. Everybody on the plantation fears him. He um, has a feeble persona that makes people kind of disregard him in an interesting sort of way. Even though they fear him, they kind of think he's physically not able to keep up or do things. But he's um, around. We used to refer to him as the Basil Rathbone yeah. of, the, <laughs> of the antebellum South. And that's what we tried to do. But I wanted to play him honestly. And I wanted everybody to understand that when Django shows up, that's a Negro we've never seen before. Not only is he on a horse, he's got a gun, and he speaks out. And the first thing I have to do is let all the other Negroes on the plantation know that's not something you can aspire to. You know, so let me put him in his place as quickly as I possibly can. And um, I wholeheartedly embrace that. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, one of the things that really needs to be taken into account we know, because we have historical perspective, that slavery is on its way out. It's two years before the, the start of the Civil War. They don't know that. Right. They right. have to think that for at least the next 150 years, at, at least, this is the way it is. Right. There is no end in sight. All those northerners, those bleeding hot liberals can say anything they want, don't mean nothing down here. They don't understand us, and ain't nothing going to have changed. Now, even at the end, you hear me saying, mm -hmm. you know, there's always going to be a candy land. This ain't going away. You know? 
this is this is here to stay. Um, <laughs> uh, Leo, uh, this is the first film you've been in in quite a long time where you're not the only name above the title, and where and it sucks. And <laughs> where uh, it's very uncomfortable for all of us. <laughs> where you are one of, although perhaps not the biggest villain of the piece, as uh, Sam was just saying. Uh, can you uh, talk a little bit about what uh, made you want to uh, take on this role? Well, t I mean, obviously, Mr. Tarantino here was uh, a major factor. But, you know, you I, we all read this script. This, there was a sort of buzz about this script or, around for a while. And, and people were talking about the next Tarantino movie that was about to come out. And the fact that he tackled this subject matter, like he did with sort of Inglorious Bastards and recreated his own history, it and tackled something as, as hardcore as, as, as slavery and, and, and combined it with the genre of having it be this crazy uh, spaghetti western feel to it with this with this lead character that sort of obliterates the the, uh, the, the cankerous rotting south was completely exciting and and he wrote this incredible character and uh, I, as soon as I read it I was incredibly excited I mean, this man was, uh, as Quentin put it, you know, he was a character that uh, represented everything that was wrong with the South at the time. You know what I mean? He was like a young Louis the Fourteenth, a young sort of a, a prince that wanted to hold on to his position of privilege at all costs, and you know, justified away. Even though he was integrated his whole life with black people, he brought up by a black man, you know, lived with him his entire life. He had to find a moral justification to treat people this way and continue his business. He had a plantation to run. And so he, he became this sort of, you know, a, this, um, uh, you know, the, I don't know, he, there's a lot of, uh, you know, the fact that, that he's, he's a Francophile, but he doesn't speak French. There's, he's a walking contradiction, you know what I mean? He lives and is brought up by black people, yet he has to regard them as not human, you know what I'm saying? It was this incredibly interesting, horrifically, uh, I mean, I mean, there was absolutely nothing about this man that I could identify with. I hated him, and it was and it was one of the most narcissistic, self-indulgent, racist, horrible characters I've ever read in my entire life. And and I, I I had to do it. It was too good not to do. You know, it was too good of a a, a character in that sense. And I don't know. I mean, um, this man writes just incredible characters, and. Uh, uh, and was also, of course, the opportunity to work with all these great people, too. Dr. King Schultz, uh, Christoph Waltz, uh, can you talk about reuniting with Quentin on this movie? And was there any hesitation on either of your parts about working together again so soon after this very iconic character in Inglorious Bastards? Neither. There was no reunification, and there was not no working again. That was just another mushroom of the fungus that was was growing subcutaneously in me all the time. Process that one. Process that. I gotta say, it's it's. I had this same problem. I had this same problem with Sam for about a decade. It's hard not to write for these guys. They say my dialogue so well that it's like for 10 years I'd write some cool bill for like seven months of the, of the year and a half of writing Kill Bill. Bill sounded just like Sam. <laughs> you know, it's hard. I've, it's like they say my dialogue so well and just aren't, you know, just the – the way I write my dialogue, which I always kind of, I always kind of fancy it as poetry, and they're the ones that make it poetry when they say it. It's just hard. It's it's just it, they come out of my pen, and sometimes it's not even appropriate. Sometimes no, you know that's not right, you know. Uh, but it's just I I have to you know I can't shut it off. I when I've been wanting to do this story for a long time. There never was some German dentist bounty hunter in the story. <laughs> All right, but the next thing I know, I sat down and wrote that opening scene, and he just flew right out of the pen like an antenna to God. Boom. And can, can you talk, Christoph, about the physical training for the role? Because I know you uh, injured yourself pretty severely at one point. I worked very hard and succeeded gloriously in falling off a horse very quickly. <laughs> 
and then my um, very early on in the training, and then my work was a little slower for a few months, and then I got back up on the horse. Um, Don, I want to ask you, uh, your performance is very exuberant in the film, which is something I think we think of with Quentin's actors, that they seem to be having a lot of fun on screen. What is it about working with Quentin that brings this out of performers? Well, as, he, as Quentin told me, he said, you sing in my key. <laughs> Did you remember that? And um, I, I, I looked at that, I looked at uh, Big Daddy um, Bennett as a, um, as, a, uh, as a character who had his fiefdom, and uh, he was fully engaged in his fiefdom. He enjoyed his fiefdom. And, um, and, and uh, as everybody has mentioned, you know, this was going to go on forever until these two showed up. And, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then, then they messed up everything, so they got to go, you know. But... Um, um, Man, yeah, that's right. Love her. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> Bettina. Um, uh, it was a joy to, to, to work with. We have sort of a, uh, an, I, I think everybody does, a second a second hand. You know, it's a look. It's a, you know, there's almost no, no, no dialogue question. I'll finish a take or something, and I'll turn around, and I'll look at him, and he'll give me some sort of hand signal. It looks like one of those Navy signalmen or something like that, and I know exactly what he means. I don't know how I know it, but uh, then we do it again. I go, yeah, that was right. That was, you know, yeah. Bring that, bring that uh, aircraft in on the other carrier, you know. So it was fun. That's kind of wonderful because I, I remember the first day I got there, I went looking for Quentin, and the day I got there, the slaves were in the field. You guys were coming up on the plantation for the first time. Jamie had his little Lord Fauntleroy suit on. And I was walking down that road through the cotton field, and I didn't realize until I got in the middle of the cotton field that all these extras were out there in this slave gear, and it was cotton, and they were picking it, and there were white dudes on horses with shotguns. And then I looked back, and Don was up on the porch of the big house and all this stuff. I was like, oh, shit. We're doing this. You know? yeah. It was yeah. almost like a Twilight Zone episode or something. It was it was it was crazy. Tomorrow, all of a sudden you yeah. find yourself, oh, yeah. how'd I get here? And I walked up there and he had an ice cold drink in his hand and I was like, damn, this is this is happening. This is it was it was it was so awesome. But everything everything started to help us do this movie. Yeah, we were oh, yeah. shooting on an actual slave plantation called Evergreen Plantation in Louisiana, and so that lent itself to all of us kind of disappearing into the story because you felt like you were making the film on sacred ground. You felt like you were, you were reenacting this behavior where these crimes against humanity were actually committed. And so it just, if it started to infiltrate everybody's acting and behavior and choices and relationships. Yeah, crazy stuff like that, yeah, crazy stuff like that happens. Like when you got whipped, everything around there, all the bugs stopped making noise, the yeah. birds stopped singing. Yeah. It was kind of like, oh shit, is this back? My, yeah. <laughs> my dresser, um, uh, who helped, helped me get my, my costume every day, found out that her ancestors were buried in the, in the cemetery on the plantation. And and when and, and that that was a serious day when she came to work and told me that, and she was you know she was visibly and they were German. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's right. Uh -huh. And they were German. Uh -huh. I forgot about that. Yeah. You know, when you get a, a, a call from Quentin Tarantino to play a role <laughs> called uh, Baghead Number Two in a movie about uh, slavery. Uh, is, uh, do you, do you even ask to see the script at that point? Uh, did you did, did it take a while to find Baghead Number Two? What what goes, or did you just say yes? I'm I, I'll do it. Yeah, no, I I don't know I, I don't know about you guys, but I got in this business to work with great filmmakers, and so, you know, I don't care if he wants me to be an extra in one of his movies. I was, like, I don't even know what the fuck I'm doing up here with these guys. I only worked for like, <laughs> I worked for like two days on them film, you know, but uh, um. It's kind of an ego stroke that they even want me here to, because I don't have anything to do with it. But uh, you know, uh, you know, I, I think it was like the weekend Moneyball had come out, and it was like um, 
I met with Quinn, and he asked to meet with me, and I was just overjoyed. So there wasn't any, like, thought about it. He wanted me to be in the film, and I was just so excited to be there. And uh, before I turn it over, I just want to ask uh, Mr. Walton Goggins at the other end, uh, as a Southerner yourself and someone who's made passing. a lot of films. Someone who's passing. <laughs> 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 made a lot of films about, about the, the South. Only and set from the Tennessee. South. No, 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 I know. Yeah. Well, we have a lot of Southerners. But yeah. I'm, I'm from Texas. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, South did you. <laughs> South, South Bronx? This <laughs> is Stan Lorelei. You from the South, sir? South of London. <laughs> did, did you have any, any sense of, of sort of a, a, a cultural responsibility or a, a social responsibility in, in bringing this chapter of Southern history to life? Well, I, I, yeah, you know, I, I, you know, the scene in the barn for me, um, what, was so, what was so difficult about that and the responsibility that I felt as an actor was showing uh, literally and metaphorically taking um, a man's ability to spread his seed in, in, in my hands and rendering that impotent. And, and I think that's what slavery did um, uh, to African Americans in this country for 245 years. And I just tried to be as, uh, as truthful and as honest um, as I could in order to respect uh, the, the, the pain in, endured by, by African Americans in this country, you know, slaves in, in, in this country. And, um, and, and I was just grateful to be given a, an opportunity uh, to do that, you know, kind of in this way. That, you know, the thing about Billy Crash and, and, and what Quentin does so well is is for poor whites you know and in, in our country at that time uh there weren't a lot of economic opportunities but one place that you could get a job was on a, on a plantation and you could rise through the, the the slave corporation uh and and if you were smart and i guess if you were ruthless enough uh you could really uh rise to a position of power and and unfortunately that was at the expense of a lot of human beings um, and, and for me, it was uh, about showing a person who, who had something to lose um, uh, by Django being there, that it was not just the color of his skin, <clears throat> but it was also my way of life, uh, uh, economically speaking. And, uh, and I was so happy that, that Quentin um, uh, gave me that in to this guy because it, it made it really three-dimensional for me. All that came through, too. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, Come on, yeah. Now he's critic. Yeah, he's kidding. It's all that shit. The economic opportunities flying. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hello. Thank you for this amazing film. It's a complete blast. I like your Battle Royale shirt. <laughs> I knew somebody would know this. Well, Mr. Tarantino, I know that in, in the pre-production of Kill Bill, there were a lot of movie uh, kung fu movie stills and movie posters bought mm -hmm. <laughs> um, before that, and also. Uh, before Inglorious Bastards, I wondered what that external stuff does, whether it's stills, posters, things you watch, that helps formulate what we see, the, the final picture. And also for the cast, anyone who would like to answer it, what external sources helped you develop or further create or deepen your characters? Wow, that's, that's a great question. After lunch, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a really great question. You know, well, you know, the thing is, you know, uh, uh, um, I think all these actors can actually tell you the feeling they have, like the first time they walk into my office, and they see all like the '60s Western posters up and the black exploitation posters up, and, and all this viscera that's there that doesn't exist anymore in movie posters. Now everything just looks like a Vanity Fair photo shoot. Every single goddamn movie looks like a Vanity Fair photo shoot. And you know, the idea of drawn posters is just doesn't happen anymore. And those were the posters. You know, those were really cool. But that style of viscera, whether it be the Spaghetti Western album covers, the black exploitation album covers, uh, the posters, all that stuff is, you know, I'm kind of trying to get at that. When, when my you know, when my stuff pops off in, in, in the big ways that it does or the imagery I'm trying to evoke, the costumes we uh, employ in the films that always have a bit of a comic book panache, you know, that's what I'm, I'm trying to get that kind, those kind of illustrations in life in my flicks. Outside source is a contradiction in terms. Um, I can only speak for myself, but the source is the script. 
uh, the script has a source. I can point it out to you. <laughs> <laughs> But you know, in, the, in that same on the same line, frankly, uh, we've got the first issue of the Django and Shane comic book has come out now, and the thing that's interesting about the comic book, more to your point, is we keep the entire script in the comic book. All right, so some of the sequences and big chapters that we dropped, we didn't even bother shooting them because well, it's just we don't want a four-hour movie, uh, are in the comic book. And I got to say, I'm as excited about the comic book as I am about the movie. It is, it's boss. <laughs> you that the um, uh, that period of time is, is one of my favorite uh, 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 periods in history in, in early developing America and um, uh, because it's 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 full of deceit and, and it, it, it's rich in human um, uh, character or lack thereof and from the Native Americans to uh, slavery and so on and so forth so I, I've read a lot about it Blood and Thunder is a great book, which I'd read before I started um, before, before I started this film, and there's there's a lot of outside material, and and for me, I like to start with with my um, uh, with outside information and uh, just research, and start layering it into my you know, the ethics of the time, you know, the social uh, graces of the time, the, uh, did they ha have indoor toilets? No. Uh, did, uh, how did uh, certain, how, how were manners uh, 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 created? And so I start from the outside and then I just slowly start to bring it all inside and emotional and stuff like that. And all, and, and a lot of that comes, like Christoph was saying, there's the source. And then for, for the character work, I start to find, I, I, for me, I like to know what it's like on that day, in that time, with that energy running around. And it just starts to, I, I do a lot of that work way before I get there so that when I'm there, it just comes out, you know, <coughs> hopefully. <laughs> question is for uh, Mr. DiCaprio. Um, I wanted to know, um, what did you learn by playing Calvin um, Candy, and also, has being an actor become all you wanted it to be? Oh, uh, wow. Has being an actor become... Okay, for, I'll first start off with the second one. Um, uh, yes, I love acting. Uh, it's what I've always wanted to do my entire life. Um, and I, I hope to continue doing this for a long time to come. It's the greatest job in the world. It truly is. We're all lucky bastards up here. The fact that we... Uh, get to do what we love for a living every every single day. Um, you know what what was what was great about doing this role honestly was the um, the the sense of community and the support mechanism that I had every single day there. I mean this was really my first attempt in in, in like I said playing a character that I had this much disdain and and this much hatred for and it was a very an incredibly uncomfortable environment to walk into. Um, you know, I've dealt with and seen racism in my surroundings in my life growing up but to the degree that you know I I had to treat other people in this film was was incredibly disturbing um, I think it was a, a, a disturbing for actors on both ends of the spectrum but it was a very uncomfortable situation and and, and like we were talking about before you know one of the pivotal moments for me in this character and sort of going to the places that I had to go to as far as the treatment of other people was uh, the, this re initial read-through that we had where Sam and Jamie told me, and I, I think I brought up the point, like, do we need to go this far at times? Do we need to push push it this far? Does it need to be this violent? Do I need to be this atrocious to other human beings? And I think it was Sam and Jamie that both said, look, man, if you, if you sugarcoat this, people are going to resent the hell out of you. You know what I mean? you got to push this guy to the utter extremes because this is all not only historically accurate, but it went even further than that. There were worse atrocities. And I think that by holding the character back, you know, you're going to do an injustice to the film and people are going to feel like you're not telling the truth. And that, from that, honestly, that was the thing that sort of ignited me into the, into the, and into going the way I did with the character. And, and once I did do, do even more research, and once, you know, I started to watch the documentaries, read about the sugar plantations, I mean, yes. I mean, we're just scratching the surface of what happened 
in our country and it and it's a sore subject matter and it's a film that there should be a subject matter that they should should be looked at more often and and not shied away from and i commend quentin for making a film that combines so many different genres and 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 as, as daring as it is to actually make the subject matter entertaining for an audience i mean it's it's a daring concept um i'll stop rambling but uh no, it was what was great at, at the at the at the core of it was to have a group of actors that were all mutually there for one another to support and drive each other further in a subject matter that I think was very difficult for all of us. And I, I couldn't have felt like I've, I had a better support mechanism. It honestly felt like, you know, we were cheerleaders for one another. Like, damn, that shit was good. Keep going. I'm fine. Be even worse to me next day. You know, be horrible. I mean, I felt like. We relied on each other because we'd be in these awful places and then call, Quinn would call cut and we'd all go, everybody okay? Everybody okay? You okay? You, you hurt? You all right? All right, let's do it again. Especially for Carrie, that, that one scene when you had to, you know, you know grab, a break, head. grab a head and we was like, you, you, you took a beating. Yeah, right. you took Like for two days straight, you yeah. know, and then, but, you know, she's, you know, it, it's, it, there's, there's the real way to do it. And that's Carrie's way. And anything else is bullshit as far as Carrie's concerned. So she was taking a beating for like two days straight. But always, hey, no, okay, it's all good. It's all good. That's, we, that's where we have to be. Anything else is going to be baby. We got to go forward. And I just, I was like, man, she's, she's the real deal. <laughs> Hi, good morning. You kind of touched upon the question I had. I just wanted to say that when I watched the movie, it didn't make me as uncomfortable as I thought it would. But I just wanted to know, uh, for Mr. Tarantino and anyone who wants to answer, were there any moments where you got really uncomfortable and had to change anything on set? There was nothing that uh, uh, nothing that I wrote that we had to change on set. Everyone was, you know, we were all, we all knew what we were doing. We all got together and everything, and. Uh, and you know, I kind of made sure with a lot of people as far as if there was anything that was uncomfortable, we talked about it bef way beforehand. Actually, I guess that's what I mean before I hired them. <laughs> we good, you know. Uh, uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, but uh, there was only there was only one thing that I felt uncomfortable about, not on not shooting, but early. Or, I mean, at the very very beginning stages upon finishing the script was uh, it's one thing to write exterior Greenville, where uh, the slave auction town was. Uh, uh, 100, 100 slaves uh, walked through this deep shit mud in chains, being moved along, wearing masks and uh, metal collars. And this whole town that's built over this, this you know, it's almost like a black Auschwitz. All right. It's one thing to write that. It's another thing to get a hundred black folks, put them in chains, mm. and march them through the mud. And um, and same thing about planting the cotton and putting you know you know an army of black folks dressed as slaves in the hot sun picking cotton in the background. And uh, I didn't. I started to question: Could I do it? I started to, uh, I, I don't think I've ever thought that about anything when it came to my work before. I started thinking, you know, God, can I do it? Can I be the reason that that's even happening? Mm. And I had actually have came up with an idea possibly of maybe shooting just those sequences alone, like maybe in the West Indies or shooting it in Brazil, where they have their own issues of slavery, but since this is an American story, there would be a, a, a once removed quality. It, frank, frankly, my problem was was having Americans do that. That was my problem, and uh, so I was almost trying to escape it. How can I do it but get around it some way so I don't have to deal with the pain? And uh, um, I went out to dinner with Sidney Poitier, and I just finished writing the script, and he's kind of like a father figure to me, and and I was explaining my little harebrained scheme. <laughs> of escaping <laughs> and maybe doing this and maybe doing that. And he listened to me and he basically told me I had to man up. You know, he goes, uh, Quentin, for whatever reason, I think you were born to tell this story. And um, 
you need to not be afraid of your own movie. You can't tell this story if you're afraid of your own movie. You just need to do it. Everybody knows what time it is. We have, we're all professionals. Everybody gets it. Just treat them with love and respect. Treat them like actors, not, not atmosphere. Let them know why they're there and what we're doing and what we're trying to get across. And it'll all be good. By the way, you're going to be doing this in the South. Those people need money. They need jobs. You're taking, you know, you got to do it. And, uh, and then you found out they'd been slaves in Uncle Tom's Cabin and they were yeah, scheduled yeah, yeah, to yeah. go into 12 years of slave when they finished being slaves for you. Yeah, yeah. So. There, yeah, there was a, yeah, there was a lot of guys. <laughs> oh, man, I was an Abraham Lincoln oh, man, vampire. I was, I was a slave in that. I'm a slave in this. Yeah, I'm a slave right. in 10 years. <laughs> I got that. I'm good with that. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you one thing that happened as a result of doing that, though. And it for me, it was one of the most profound days on our set was we were shooting one of these days of picking cotton in the Louisiana heat and everybody was really hot and exhausted and you could tell that it mean even for Jamie and I the the waking up every day and putting yourself in the mental state of somebody who you know your constitution says you're a fraction of a person not a whole human being you know it was just starting to wear on everybody a little bit and we had this one background actor who was a pastor who kind of paused everybody and said we have to remember that we are the answer to these people's prayers. That the people who did this work dreamt of a day where you could not be property, but own property. Where you could read, where you could vote, where you could get married, where you could have a job and be compensated. And it really, you know, again, on that sacred ground, it forced everybody to shift and man up and own kind of how blessed we are that we get to be here and tell this story and not feel victimized by it, but know that it's a, it's a story of a hero and that that's a profound opportunity. <coughs> one of the most outrageous yet courageous films to come out of Hollywood, yet it has been very well received. Why do you think that is? Um, well, hopefully because it's, it's a good movie. And that's not a smart-ass answer. I think, really? yeah, <laughs> I think, I think it's a good movie. And, uh, and I think, I hope, I might not be the person to answer. I made the damn thing, all right, you know. Um, but, you know, what I was talking about, all the different things that we juggled, I think to pull that off went a long way to actually be able to to deal with some of the, to deal with the pain to deal with the history but do it in a way that's an exciting adventure story that the two don't negate the other you know so i mean when you talk about this it almost you always seem to have to go down the dirt road of talking about the horrible time of that past and that's fair enough and that because it it, it is but the whole i hope was that if you leave your house and go to a movie theater and pay a ticket to sit with a bunch of strangers and watch this movie, you're going to have, ultimately, by the end of it, a, a great time at the movies. And I think, uh, so far, so, so far, so good. And In the end, Quentin always, writes movies. <laughs> Quentin always writes movies that he wants to see. Because uh, we watch a lot of the same kind of movies. We talk about stuff all the time. So he writes movies that he wants to see. He generally writes a role in there that I'm going to do that I want to do because I want to see myself in that kind of movie. Uh, and I think I represent a lot of moviegoers. He represents a lot of fans also in terms of people going to movies, watching things they want to see. And when you get it right, you get it right. It's an entertaining film. Yeah, you know, there's some stuff in there. There's some historically correct stuff. There's some historically exaggerated stuff. And some of it's horrific. But it's a great film. It does what you want to do when you pay your whatever it is, thirteen fifty. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They go in the movie now and sit in the dark with a whole bunch of strangers. When you come out of there, you felt like you saw a movie and you got your money's worth. And that's ultimately what we want to happen. And um, I, I think, think he always theme, delivers on that. The original, the, the impetus for all the adventure and action and all of it is love. I mean, it's a completely universal theme, this idea. Everybody wants to be loved so badly that their prince would slay the dragons. Oh, that's some old In girly this shit. This shaft on a horse. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot the of girls out horseback. here. shaft on horseback. It's yeah. kind of, you know, shaft yeah. in the old west with yeah. a little bit of Hong Kong, yeah. Hong Kong bullet ballet thrown in there. That's how the slow motion Something for everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something for everybody. <laughs>